Hey, what's up? It's episode 126, pain points of wealth and the concentration of stocks in the S&P 500 continue to climb. In fact, seven stocks account for 27% of the index, which begs the question, how diversified are you if you own the S&P 500? Well, we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about this fantastic economy that just won't fall off a cliff no matter what they tell you. We're going to talk about some of the economic data that's come out, what it means for the rest of the year. And on the tipping point today, we have a very special guest. We have our colleague, Frankie Lagrataria. She's going to be on the show. We're going to discuss a lot of different questions you may have right now about how your investment portfolio is positioned. It's going to be great stuff. We're going to give some pro tips. Check it out. Hit the music. Guys, one of the um, best leading economic indicators has always been the stock market. And the S&P, although it is, you know, capitalization weighted and overweighted right now in mega tech stocks, you know, had the first half of up 17%. I think that's all you need to know, right? (laughs) You don't need to look at all the other statistics and listen to all the negative nabobs talk about how awful things are. Market's smarter than everybody. It is, but I think also you got to be careful because I think there's always like false advertising there, right? If the S&P 500 makes you feel like, well, I've got 500 stocks, that's great diversification. But because it's capitalization weighted and you have literally seven stocks that basically drive everything in that index, and I think that could be a little bit of a problem, right? So, you know, it's a good time to broaden out your exposure and not just buy the S&P 500 blindly like a lot of investors like to do. Yeah, that's a good point, Ryan. You know, I met with a prospective client the other day and had a look at his portfolio, and he was very thrilled to tell me that he had diversification in his portfolio. He had he had three different funds, and guess what? They all follow the S and P five hundred. Well, you know, that, again, it's a, that makes sense. You know, people do like to follow uh, the trend, right? The trend is your friend. How, how many times you guys heard that in your career? But you know, it's it's not a problem. It just smacks of opportunity, right? The equal weight S and P is a better place to invest right now than the capitalization weighted S&P. And, you know, as one strategist uh, used to work for Merrill Lynch, an old friend of mine came on the other day and he said, you know, I just can't believe that there's only seven companies in the world that have any opportunity for growth. <laughs> you know, when you have 10 to 12,000 publicly traded companies, he said, I think maybe you might be missing something if you're just focused on seven companies. So there's, I, there's lots of opportunity out there now, guys. I, I think I, it's really exciting. I totally disagree, Bob. I think all your money should be in NVIDIA and you should just go on vacation for like two years and you're going to be fine. Um, That was a joke. Don't take that as financial advice. But no, no, it's it's, it's a great point. In fact, if you look at June, June was like what you wanted to see, the broadening out of the rally, because one of the arguments has been, right, the market has bad breath um, and all the jokes that go along with that, right? Because it's just been a couple of stocks that have driven the S&P 500. But you look at June, I mean, we had material stocks up over 11%. Industrial stocks over 11%, consumer discretionary stocks over 12%, energy stocks up almost 7%, financials up over 6%. So you know, you're starting to see a lot of other sectors move. And to your point, Bob, they trade so much cheaper than those big mega cap names that everyone wants to talk about on TV all day, um, which like provides a great opportunity to get in even after this big rally. Hey, guys, call me cynical if you'd like. Um, but we are in the third year of a presidential cycle. And historically, it's always been a strong year, and especially if the first half of the year is really strong. Now, I don't know a lot of you know, politicians personally, but it just appears to me that they love that job and they like to get reelected. So chances are the government's going to pull out all stops for the people in power to try and keep that job. You know, I might be a little cynical. Might be a realist. You guys decide. <laughs> Dad, I actually think this is all predicated on whether Ryan actually goes to the polls this year. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's not go there, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, it's, it's a great point, right? Because we've talked about like there's going to be a lot of money, fiscal stimulus in the economy with this huge infrastructure bill that was passed, which is desperately needed. And we've talked about the reshoring with all the manufacturing that's going to be happening in this country because of the incentives right now to do semiconductors or produce semiconductors here in the U.S., electric vehicles, solar equipment. So, I mean, there's just going to be a ton of stimulus 
being beamed at the economy even after the pandemic. Um, and it's going to be more on that like physical side, like manufacturing, infrastructure, a lot of things that haven't really driven the economy in a very long time. Yeah, that's true. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of my clients, their son, instead of opting to go to a four-year college, has opted to go to trade school just because he found that the opportunities um, in, that, in that area is going to go and become an electrical lineman are a lot better than what you can get in the corporate sector right now. Hey, Chris, that reminds me when I sent Chris uh, Ryan to trade school and they found out he doesn't know how to use tools. So they sent him to <laughs> build over instead. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Ryan, you talk about the future, talk about it, But, you know, here's the problem with investing. This is the problem I'm seeing, you know, with a lot of clients and a lot of prospective clients. It's like, yeah, all right, it sounds good. You know, you're going to have all this onshoring, reshoring. You've got this industrial revolution maybe going on, this manufacturing renaissance, the roaring 20s, as Ryan calls it. You know, that's that's not certain, though. You know, it's certain right now I can get 5.4% on a three-month treasury. And based on your projections, all I need is a 5% return. I'm set for life. So why should I take any risk investing in that stock market you talk about all the time? Yeah, well, we've talked about this a lot, though, right? The biggest issue with the seduction of buying those shorter-term treasuries is reinvestment risk. Now, look, if it's short-term cash that you need, well, great, right? That's way better than you were getting on your money market fund or treasury uh, yields for like a decade, right? I mean, that's the best we've seen in a long time. But the problem is, at some point, that money comes due, whether it's a year from now, two years from now. And we've talked about this a lot, but interest rates could be lower then. So now all of a sudden, you're stuck reinvesting at 3%. And meanwhile, you may have missed a magnificent move in the stock market, like which you would have done the last couple months. Because let's face it, you know, treasury yields went up to like 5% last fall, well, the market's up 25% over that time frame. And if you locked into a 5% treasury there, you still haven't gotten your full 5%. So I think it is very, very short sighted, penny wise, dollar foolish to think about short term treasuries here when you need a long term investment strategy for your really for your retirement or whatever you're planning for. Yeah. Not to yeah. mention that over time, those dividend yields on those stocks goes up over time. So your cash flow increases. That's a really good point, Chris. I mean, let's look at real estate investment trusts right now. You know, real estate investment trusts throw off an enormous amount of cash flow. I mean, they're yielding close to four and a quarter to four and a half percent right now. Uh, and as you say, Chris, those dividends, those, those payments tend to go higher. And real estate, you know, everybody hates it right now uh, because yeah. no one's in, in the corporate offices. <laughs> but, well, you know, REITs are not all about corporate offices. No, they're not. But here's another good point. This is why the, st the stock market is a great future predictor, right? Because if you look at those REITs that deal in commercial real estate, like it's no secret that occupancy rates right now are extremely low. Well, those REITs are trading at like a 70% discount from where they were two years ago, right? I mean, it's the markets have already priced that in. And I think that's what people never understand when it comes to investing is it's not about what's happening today. Markets are priced to the future. So whatever you feel right now, whatever's going on right now, it's irrelevant as a market investor because public markets look to the future. And you know, no matter how much we say it, I think people forget that all the time. Sounds like if you don't have REITs, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we'll you know, that's the key. Months. I mean, you, you really need that diversification across asset classes, within asset classes. You know, hey, there's nothing wrong with short-term treasuries. Yeah, you should own some, right? You should have money coming due every year in a bond portfolio to take advantage of compounding. But, you know, you got to look at the averages, right? You look at the a year ago, um, if you were investing in a one-year treasury, you're getting 2.5%. Now you're getting 5.5%, you know, and the historical average is about 2.5%. So what are the chances, you know, that you're going to be able to invest at 10 and 11%, you know, a year from now? I think it's going to revert to the mean, as all markets do, and you got to be careful about that. Just be certain that you're diversified, spreading it out. And, you know, you don't have to have all winners in your portfolio every day. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 126, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you saved over a million dollars and you're thinking, I want a more hands-on approach, I want a second opinion on what I'm doing, well, here's your shot to do it. Bob, Chris, and I will run for you our total financial master plan, We'll do that with no obligation or cost. If you saved over a million dollars, we'll literally go through your entire portfolio. We'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you where all the hidden costs are on those investments, whether it's an annuity, insurance products, brokerage products. We'll show you how to reduce all the costs on your portfolio, optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make. It's what you take. We'll give you our full tax playbook, and we're going to build for you your own financial portal. We're going to give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life and hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. 
Do you need an income plan for retirement? How do you take Social Security? How much should you be saving every year to make sure you're on track for retirement or financial independence? We're going to make sure you're properly diversified. Did you get hit hard as markets have been extremely volatile over the last two years? Or have you been sitting in cash, paralysis by analysis, trying to figure out what to do with your money? We're going to put together a full investment game plan, show you how to grow your money, but most importantly, protect it. Over the rest of your life, simply go to www paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E, having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And we've got a very special guest on our program today. We have my colleague, Bob and Chris's colleague and financial advisor at Pain Capital Management, Miss Frankie Lagrateria. Frankie, great to have you on the show. Two weeks in a row, doesn't get better than that. Hey. Yeah, lucky me. Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> it's lucky. Us. Pleasure's all ours, Frank. <laughs> so, and I thought today, you know, since Frank, you're a financial advisor at Payne Capital, and literally all we do is advise people on what they should be doing with their money, how to allocate it for what we call financial independence. And we've really heard every concern under the sun. And I thought right now we could talk about what is top of mind for our clients for our listeners and address some of the bigger issues that everybody's thinking about today. And I think one of the bigger ones is inflation, right? Is inflation coming down? Should you adjust your portfolio in light of the fact that we have higher inflation than we did the last 10 years? And maybe, <laughs> right? It, it depends on how you're set up, maybe. I think a, a big one that I've noticed is, are you taking advantage of cash? Is it just sitting in a bank getting you, you know, 0% or sitting in your, your, your home getting you absolutely nothing, you know, just risk? You know, that's one of the biggest thing I've noticed. So what are you talking about the money at home that people putting it under the mattress these days, Frankie? Under the mattress, in their backyard, you know, in the Candyland box. You know, it, it basically, it's all the same, right? Because it's getting you nothing. I'm pretty confident. <laughs> Yeah, but if you put it in a savings account, you're pretty much getting nothing also. I mean, I think the average uh, bank deposit is getting like 67 basis points or some ridiculous number. Yes, yeah, so is at home. Yielding that's so low, it said you are not yielding anything. You're like, there is no tax statements. Yeah. So I took my money and I've been you know, reaching out to all of my clients and telling them, mm. hey, take a look at that. Does your bank literally tell you they're not paying you anything? Move it somewhere that does. You know, it's funny, that First Republic Bank that went under... Um, they were lending money out at a very cheap level and then investing in long-term bonds you know, right before the Fed raised interest rates. But on their savings and checking accounts, they paid zero interest. So why would people have billions and billions of dollars at First Republic Bank? It doesn't make any sense. No. It's the inertia of money, I think. And you're seeing it now, too. Like, I mean, every time I talk to a client and it's like, oh, yeah, I've got a couple hundred thousand that I'm keeping on the side that I need uh, at the bank earning like point, like your point, by like 0.6%, not even a percentage point. Meanwhile, in a treasury backed money market fund, you're getting like 4.7% on a couple hundred thousand dollars. That's a lot of money you're leaving on the table. So I think that is like one of the first things you want to look at right now is like, okay, how much cash am I sitting on? And how much is the bank screwing me? Um, and rectify that right away. And it's an easy fix. But we forget because rates were low for so long, then now interest does matter and it does have a big impact on your cash. I talked to a client the other day and he called his bank and he said, hey, my buddy can get me a lot more interest on my cash. I'll make sure I'm in a money market fund. So he said, oh, yeah, you're in a money market fund. So he got a statement and it was yielding 0.67. He said, I thought you said I'm in a money market fund. Yeah, well, that's what we call it here. So they can call it anything they want. You know, don't tell the vehicle, tell them, ask them what the rate is and make sure it's in treasuries. I love about Bob always gets to the bottom line. But, you know, what about that cash that you don't need for the short term? I mean, there's no better hedge against inflation like the stock market. No, I don't a- know, Chris. I saw on daytime TV it was gold. <laughs> gold, um, so- gold is the hedge against becoming wealthy. That's what, the, that's what gold is. <laughs> Somebody's clearly watching Fox, uh, Fox all day because I think gold commercials are the only thing they have. Uh, in between <laughs> segments. So we know you're doing with your time, Frankie. But no, no, that's a great point. And we, we talked about that today too, or earlier in the earlier segment, like the bigger mistake here is for money you don't need shorter term. Like I know the 5% interest sounds great, but that's got problems because you're not locked into that rate for very long. And let's face it, your goals are probably going to go out five years, 10 years, 15 years. And all of a sudden, if that 5% you're getting today becomes 3% in a year, 
and all of a sudden you miss the opportunity to lock into some longer term bonds and get into the market for the longer term, you're probably going to have a huge opportunity cost that's going to be very detrimental to your long term financial picture. I want to go back to gold for a second, guys. You know, you, you see these commercials, right? And there's, and there's a, like, it costs a lot of money. We know what it takes to, you know, put a national commercial on for any product. Um, and they don't make much when you buy gold bullion. So, you know, what I found out was they sell a lot of coins and they have a huge markup on the coins. There's no secondary market. Um, and I've spoken to people who have, you know, put hundreds of thousands of dollars at these firms and it's worth half, maybe half, um, if you can even sell it at all. So, you know, caveat emp there for anybody thinking about calling these gold people, you know, they're going to try and sell you coins. Stay away from that. Chris, well, you know what I have ashamed a about his coin collection. <laughs> buy it the rest of the show. Well, you know, Dad, I have a, I have a gold coin that I that I stole from your office. I still have it, and uh, it's steal it. I gave it to you. Oh, that's right, you did give it to me. <laughs> what is uh, that sucker worth now, Chris? I forget how much gold was in that. It's uh, it's one troy ounce. So whatever a, a troy ounce was worth today, what like something uh, like gold. Uh, but the problem is. is, is that with with physical gold, is that you have to, to also have to pay to store it. So you know, it's an additional cost, and it doesn't uh, doesn't doesn't raise above and beyond inflation. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, yeah, it doesn't pay any interest. Doesn't pay any dividend. Can't eat it. Can't carry it around. People mm -hmm. can steal it. I, yeah, there's so many reasons why gold is not a great investment. Um, I think we do mention a lot on the show. But I, I think the other big question right now that we're getting from everyone is, what should I be doing to lower my taxes? I have to think with this huge deficit we have, a government that just doesn't like to stop spending, well, eventually here taxes have to go higher. And I would say, yes, you need to be focusing on this right now. Any tax benefit you can exploit, you have to do it. You know, I think the biggest problem, and, and I'm just amazed that mutual fund companies are still in business uh, because they basically, you know, churn an index and then call it active management, uh, charge you a tax and then, uh, you know, and, and trade for capital gains every year and underperform. I mean, it's just amazing to me that anyone would use an active manager because, you know, you don't ever want to interrupt you know, your compounding, you know, on purpose. And trying to pick winners is just ridiculous. I think another big one is, are you, are you contributing and is your spouse contributing to a retirement plan? A lot of my clients don't know that just because one spouse may have retired, they may still be able to contribute to a retirement plan. I know when I look at my biweekly pay and I see that gross number, I'm like, ooh, <laughs> let's, let's make sure that we're maxing out that 401k. <laughs> That's yeah, a good sign, Frankie. Frankie. A lot of people think once they retire, they can't contribute, you know, they're, or if they're past the age of, of normal retirement. If they're still working, they can contribute to their plans. Yeah, well, you can. Or if their spouse is working. What was that? Maybe. I said, or maybe if their spouse is working. True. Yeah, right, right. Then they could, could uh, potentially both do like an IRA. There's, there's a lot of things you can do. The other big point there too is, now you have the option with most of your 401k and retirement plans is to do a Roth contribution as opposed to a traditional 401k contribution, which may make a lot of sense. You don't get a deduction up front but a lot of us are in historically low tax brackets. I know it doesn't feel that way, but if you look at it historically right now, taxes are kind of low. Um, so it might be a good time to not get the deduction up front, but if you put into a Roth 401k, all of that growth and that money is tax-free for life. You take out all those gains tax-free later, which can be a much bigger benefit, and most of us don't address that. It's a small tweak, but has a huge impact on your financial life long-term. Yeah, but you know, I see a lot of independent contractors and self-employed people missing huge opportunities because they think, I don't work for a big company. I'll not have a 401k. They get the best thing ever. They can put together a pension. They can put a lot of money away. And that's the problem, not working with an advisor. We just brought a client on. She's 60 years old. Um, she makes a lot of money. And she hasn't put a dime away other than an IRA for the last 10 years. Uh, she could have a you know a couple million dollars now sitting in retirement. You know, you had talked about that. You know, at some point in the future, we're going to have to pay for all the stimulus. So chances are, if we're betting people here, the taxes are going to go up. And you know, one tool out that's out there right now is that you can actually convert money from your IRA into a Roth IRA at today's tax rate. So, you know, if you really believe that taxes are going up in the future, uh, you can get some of that money out at a big discount, convert it into something that now grows tax free for life. And you know what's important about that, Chris? I always say to my clients, um, when you're looking at your when you're looking at your net worth and you're looking at your accounts, you may have a million dollars in a 401k or a traditional IRA. And I always have to remind my clients, yes, that might be a million dollars, but realistically, that's eight hundred thousand. Yeah, that's may right. even be less depending on what tax bracket you're in. That's now, if you have a million dollars in a Roth, a million dollars in a Roth, that's a million dollars.
That's right, Frank. Because that, that that pre-tax account's actually a joint account with the federal government. <laughs> That's good. Clever, <laughs> Chris. Um, well, you know, a lot of our clients, a lot of our clients are late in life, and uh, even though they're still contributing to a four hundred one k, the Roth doesn't make a lot of sense in terms of contribution. But for their children and their grandchildren, you know, and they think, oh, well, I want that deduction because I need the extra money to go buy a car, you know, pay for a nicer apartment, but. You run the numbers on someone in their 20s contributing to a Roth 401k versus a deductible 401k. The numbers are mind boggling. Um, and that's just at current tax rates. Imagine if rates go higher or go back to what they were in the 60s and 70s where you had a 95% or marginal tax bracket. Um, it's just incredible, you know, how much money you can save and, and, and accumulate tax free in your lifetime if yeah. you're in your 20s. Well, if they go up to 70, 80%, Chris says he's sailing to Mexico. So that's how he's going to solve that problem. <laughs> but, you know, the other, the other big one we'll wrap up after this that I hear all the time is, you know, you heard about Biden bucks and how the government's going to confiscate all of our IRAs and 401ks. There's tons of videos online about this with all these doomsayers that are like trying to sell you a newsletter, basically. And my argument there is, well, let's see. Every politician once gets reelected. Most of us have a retirement plan. So for them to confiscate, confiscate our retirement plans would be like political suicide. I just don't buy it that that's actually going to happen. Well, I've never in my career seen a big dire forecast ever come true, right? If, you're, if you have a scary headline, they're trying to sell you something. They're not trying to be your friend. They're trying to sell you something. And, you know, the only time I hear about these things are from clients who get these crazy newsletters I can't even find them on the internet. I mean, it's just, there must be a select group of people they mail these things to because some of these ideas are so out there. Um, they're not mainstream, and it's just um, you know makes people do crazy things. So be careful. Be careful what you read. Well, you know, some of that stuff you get through email, and if you eventually click through all the BS, it eventually comes to an ad for gold. So all birds <laughs> need to gold, <laughs> or maybe maybe Bob Coin. You know, we're we're gonna we're gonna get, we're gonna leave the dollar for for Bob Coin. That's that's probably. Probably the most realistic outcome, actually, if we're to be honest about it. You Buy know, a coin with a true patriot. In my, uh, in my paycheck. Is that why I'm getting paid in Bob coins now, guys? <laughs> actually, well, Frank, you know, Ryan, guys, you know, since I'm mining for Bob coin as my side <laughs> business, can I set up a self-employed 401k for that business? <laughs> another another topic. A, a financial another advisor. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's face it, guys. You know, um, yeah, the Beatles wrote about it a long time ago about the tax man. We all know we're overtaxed. Look, everybody has to pay their fair share, but don't give many of yours. You know, make sure that your income is tax free. Make sure you're taking care of every tax deduction that's available to you legally. Um, don't skip a year because you know what? You can never get it back. Um, and you're not going to get a lot of benefits out of that money you're sending to the government. So let's be smart. Let's do some tax planning, be tax efficient, and everything else take care of itself. All right, it's the Hidden Facts of Finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, the BLS, that's the Bureau of Labor Statistics for all the laymen out there, found that Americans working full-time from home, 33% in 2022, up from 25% in 2019, put in two and a half hours fewer a day than their colleagues at the office. It's no wonder labor force productivity has been negative for the past five straight quarters, Amit office occupancy that remains at a sub 50% in the largest U.S. cities. Sounds like people are going to have to go back to the office. I don't know, Rye. Working from home uh, works for a lot of us. I mean, what time do you guys take your nap every afternoon? <laughs> Case in point, well, we know Bob's not doing a lot of work over there. If you can get something done in 5.7 hours versus 8.2, I call that efficiency. Yeah. I think BLS stands for big loser. <laughs> skipping. <laughs> I think there's a lot of temptations working away. I think the trend for most major companies is going to make their employees spend a little more time in the office. I'm already seeing it. Uh, I think, Rye, you see it in the streets in New York. I see it from the clients I'm speaking to. There's, there's a lot more demand. And I think that, you know, companies need to develop a culture, especially for anyone that's coming out of college, going into the workforce. You just can't learn a lot sitting in, in you know, in your in your parents' basement or in your apartment. Uh, yeah. You need that interaction. You need that, you know, you need that mentoring to really become successful in your career. Long story short, buy commercial real estate, uh, real estate investment trusts. All right, Chris. If workers fill up offices at a 2019 rate 
and work 8.2 hours a day instead of at home at 5.7 hours, the economy will add roughly 800 million weeks of work, an 8% bump. Sounds like productivity can come back in a big way if we all just go back to the office. Well, I have a sneaking suspicion that, you know, you were doing your spreadsheet over the weekend and you calculate what an 8% bump would be in your pay rise. So I guess that's why you're making us all come back to the office. <laughs> I'm always focused on the bottom line, Chris. So uh, we'd like to see you in the office on weekends, actually. So we can talk about that after the episode. All right. If you Frank, don't come in Saturday, don't come in Sunday. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> all right, okay. Frank. <laughs> This, I don't even know who you know who this is, Frankie, but there are 23 streaming services that offer versions of the Bob Ross channel. That's to do with the fro. They used to do paintings uh, via smartphones, that. TVs, laptops together, generating 15 million viewers a month, according to American Public Television, which handles syndication of the show. That's more than quadruple the audience of the finale of Succession. Wow. That's remarkable. I'm not surprised. I know people from all walks of life. I have uh, my friends who have brand new babies and they're watching Bob Ross. And then I have uh, friends that I, I work out with and they're in their 40s and they do the uh, super, super Bob is what they call it. They watch Bob Ross and they paint, they paint his, uh, his pictures together. And, and it's fantastic. He is a lovely, lovely person and it's fun to watch and it's very cathartic. And I... Yeah. They get so much nicer than than Succession, which is all horrible people. <laughs> totally agree. And so much I ever watched, Frankie, where I, I despised every character. You know, it's like, and I loved the season finale, but I was just like, yeah, they're all awful. <laughs> and at the end of the day, they're all walking away with a billion dollars. So I'd like to have a billion dollar problems. <laughs> mm. There you go. Well, well, I think we know this much. Bob Ross has great hair and so does Bob Payne. I think it's no coincidence. <laughs> All right, Chris. The baby Bob boomers said. had $74.8 trillion in net worth at the end of the first quarter, and they've just started to spend it, even though Bob's been spending it for years. The net worths of Gen X and millennials generations are much smaller, $39.9 trillion and $7.9 trillion currently. Adding the net worth of the silent generation, $18 trillion, that totals $140 trillion in net worth for all U.S. households. That's a lot of wealth that can be spent another driver of the U.S. economy. Yeah, well, all of my Gen X and millennial clients, you better start saving. We're going to catch up to those boomers. Hey, guys, this is just proof once again that the baby boomers, greatest generation in history. Look how much more wealth we've accumulated than the rest of you guys. <laughs> What's that eighth world wonder again, Bob? Isn't it compounding? <laughs> so, hey, forget about the time involved. We're in first. Yeah, all right, we're in under, first. Never underestimate the boomers' ability to spend on all those great strip halls down in Florida. <laughs> right. And the generation that created greed is good, but that's fodder for another episode. All right. Well, Frankie, thank you for coming on today. Great to have you. Frankie Lagerterry, one of our star financial advisors here at Payne Capital. That's it for this week, episode 126. I hope you enjoyed it. If you really like our podcast, please subscribe on Spotify. If this is on iTunes, give us that five star rating and leave us a comment if you would. And if this is on YouTube right now, you can like this episode. You can subscribe to our, our podcast there and you can add that little notification bell so you can be updated every week of our new content. That's it for this week's Pain Points of Wealth. Stay loose and keep an open mind.